Okay, Dan Roberts here in the FOS studio in New York, and I've got Paul Rabel from the PLL here today. Paul, thanks for coming in. It's so good to see you, man. You were so one of my first you. interviews when we launched the PLL in 2018. Wow. So you, you guys have come a long way with the Premier Lacrosse League. I mean, when we talked at that time, or maybe it was even the second interview we did, but you were talking up, hey, now we're on NBC Digital, and we're yeah. on you know, NBC Sports Gold, or whatever yeah. that streaming platform was. Now we're with ESPN. Yeah. I mean, we are seeing the evolution in terms of distribution and media. And as we know, for an upstart sports league, it's all about media deal and distribution. Yeah, you could argue for tier one sports leagues, it's about media rights. Yeah. It still remains the number one revenue stream for the NFL and the NBA, and Major League Baseball is gonna sort theirs out with the RSNs. I have to, urgently. Yeah, well, what I would say about our time announcing the league in 2018 was still early related to private equity and you know the, the amount of sophisticated capital that we see coming into pro sports, specifically sort of like tier two, tier three emerging leagues and the value proposition. If you look at the NBA over the 20 year period of 2002 to 2021, on average, the teams increased by 1000%. And so that outpaced any MLB, any NHL team and the S&P 500, which by the way, over a 20 year period, the S&P is up eightfold. You know, if, if, especially if you're investing on an annual basis. Well, so, I, I always say that there's no such thing as a guaranteed investment, or you shouldn't say there is, but buying a piece of a major pro sports franchise, pretty close to guaranteed in the last couple decades. And I'm sure we'll talk year. about why, foundationally, because it's not just media. Media just leads the way. But to your point, uh, and what I'll also highlight from one of our board members who is a uh, co-founder of Arctos now as a former partner at CAA and David O'Connor, he said the hardest thing to do in professional, in professional sports is to secure your first media rights deal. And that's what you're referencing when we went from NBC to ESPN on a paid relationship. It took the MLS that started in the 90s and Don Garber all the way to 2007, one of the great commissioners of our time, to secure the first rights fee for MLS. And so there's a lot of work that goes into it, not just delivering from a number standpoint to your network partner, but in today's day and age where I kind of think about streaming as to what cable was to broadcast in the 90s, you have to be committed to where your network partners are going directionally. Um, and then you have to have a really powerful demo. And right now we have a, a very young audience mm. that is digitally savvy that has high utilization even when we're co-streaming on ESPN Plus when that same game's on ABC or ESPN. Uh, so that first platform that we were on was a test and learn. And I'll get to why it was important. It was NBC Gold. So you could buy the season package. This was pre-Peacock. Hmm. And so it was far more um, sort of like a legible way of understanding your growth and your audience. And because your loyalists, you know, who's willing to subscribe. You could track where they were coming from, how, how they were sort of like moving throughout the platform throughout the year, when they were coming in, and when they were churning. And it was, it was very boxed in and simple. Then we moved over to Peacock, which they structured a new partnership inside of our first three years to do that, where there's less attribution. But the utilization was still growing for us. Mm. If you go to ESPN Plus, which we were the first, uh, one of the first properties to start simulcasting when they were still building the platform to what many leagues do today, um, here's why it's important is that if you look at NBC Gold and what we were able to do when we grew, one of which is uh, a, a really big point of conversation today, which is it's not just subscribers, it's advertisers. And when we launched with NBC Gold at the time with other sports leagues, you would go, well, this is like entertainment, the trend of entertainment. So if a customer is gonna spend a subscription fee to get access to a new product, then we're not gonna serve them ads. So it was like novel in 2019 to say, okay, let's just stay in the huddle during the ad break. Mm -hmm. All this feedback started coming back from the industry that fans actually wanted to be served their spots and dots. And it was a new way to uh, think about where a lot of the streamers are now investing into the advertising tiers of their products. So if you think about Amazon and Netflix and such. Um, so sports, different than entertainment, is a compounding investment for a distributor or a tech platform if you take a look at, okay, we're gonna buy the next, we're gonna purchase the next Ridley Scott film for $200 million, or get the, an NFL package on mm -hmm. Christmas Day, let's just say both are gonna drive the same amount of subscriptions. 
What Ridley Scott can't do is bolt on advertising dollars to Netflix's 280 million non-ad tier subscribers. The NFL can. Yeah. So it's a, it's a whole new proposition that we're going to see unfold over the next three to four years, which was much different than when we were first on NBC Gold. Yeah, yeah. So much growth. And this whole space has changed. I mean, I like to say that we're living through a transition period where you still need, I mean, you mentioned the RSNs. Like, if you live in a certain city and you have to see your NHL or MLB team, you need to get the local RSNs. So there's people who still need cable, but every year there's more and more and more big NFL games and other league games streaming, yeah. exclusive to streamers. I mean, let's talk in 10 years, it, it'll, it will have continued. But when you look around the landscape, I mean, you know, great to be a partner of ESPN, but you probably also feel like, who knows, sky's the limit in terms of distribution. You mentioned Peacock. Amazon is in this game, YouTube, Google yeah. owned is in this game, Netflix has NFL games, so everyone is kind of crowding yeah. into the room for all kinds of live sports rights. Well, sports are the last standing firewall for appointment watching television, which is the biggest unlock going back to ad dollars, right? So you, so ad, ad, the ad business is so favorable to sports because of the appointment watching component, which was eradicated out of entertainment when, stre when DVR happened first, then streaming. So if an advertiser can count on eyeballs and specific eyeballs on the platform, then they're gonna likely serve a portion of their budget, which by the way, globally, at the end of 2025, the advertising uh, industry is gonna be $1 trillion. And as we talk about churn of broadcast cable subscribers in the US down to 60, it's still a $60 billion advertising business. So ads are so, so important. Um, the second part around where you know, I think technology and streaming is taking us is helping sports accelerate internationally. Mm. And that was a big focus I know of Nick Khan's and the WWE's when they move over to Netflix is that it's just, it's simpler for them. They're automatically distributed around the world. And I know that's even what Zaslav struggles with and he has his international properties, but if you're in London, you can't watch Max. You know, and ESPN in our relationship, we're in 140 countries or so. And that's something that Jimmy and, and the team are working on, not only from a, a diversity of product offerings, but that sort of switch to turn on and off internationally as they build their, their relationships globally. That's valuable to properties that are looking to grow top line interest and revenue. Yeah, Roger Goodell just said recently that by next season he expects there to be seven NFL games outside the US. So, you know, international expansion, big big for all, all the leagues. Um, I don't wanna to talk too much about ESPN during this interview, but one more question because we just had some news today, which is that ESPN will use uh, this generative AI, I think it's um, Microsoft Azure powered, to do game summaries. And they're starting out with game summaries and recaps of two leagues, PLL, and NWSL. So I don't know, do they have to approach you for something like that? Is yeah. that something you're actually involved with? And you know, from the journalism side of things and the media side of things, is this, oh God, here comes the AI writing or, or this makes more sense and is not quite an example of that. Talk, talk to us about how it'll work. Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty interesting. So I assume you're referring to the interview that Jimmy did uh, with John Oran and Puck and then the articles that came out since then where he was speaking uh, proactively on uh, ESPN's usage of AI and other means of technology to enhance their product offering across not just ESPN Plus but forthcoming flagship. We'll see what happens with Venue. They have their virtual MVPD relationship in Hulu and then they have the MVPD relationship. So that, that's how I see ESPN. And by the way, and, I, and I'm going to get your, to your answer, I'm, I, but you know, I'm a proud partner and I said this before we started recording. Uh, I think that was a really strong set of counterpunches mm. that ESPN threw at big tech to say, okay, we are going to be everywhere and offer different price points, whether it's someone who wants skinny sports mm -hmm. with Fox and, uh, and Warner, or if it's someone we'll who just launches, wants the big yes. flagship, right? Or if it's someone who wants to stick to broadcast. So I, I think they've, they've moved brilliantly there. Um, on the AI front, here's what I'll say. I studied the strike uh, in the film business a year ago. Um, I believe that AI augments effectiveness of your people. We don't use, and I know ESPN is not introducing AI to replace the workforce. They're looking to multiply um, output. And when it comes to 
emerging leagues like the PLL and the NWSL, where they have already resourced us for the first time this year with personnel to cover games. Remember, we play four games a weekend. And so to be able to get content and more content out, not just game recaps as they cited, but also highlights and um, closed captioning, I view it as augmenting effectiveness mm -hmm. and not replacing. And I think it's so critical to get that right. And it was an example of you know, the difference between Jimmy's interview and a tweet. Mm -hmm. Jimmy's interview, everyone gets it because you get long form chance like you and I have to discuss it. The tweet, you don't really. Harder and, to get through nowadays. And yeah. it gets ratioed, right. which leads to this conversation. Right. But I believe that much like Google search did in uh, the 90s and early 2000s, it enhances our ability to get better output faster. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I, in regards to Upstart League, it's like, I also think that we're past the days of just the big four. Yeah. You know, it was all about oh, the yeah. big four forever, and now it's, it's really, you know, you mentioned MLS. WNBA yeah. is a great test case right now. Yeah. I mean, I think hard to argue otherwise that this is their biggest year, this is their moment in the sun more than any other year in the past. Do you look at that and think, you know, how can we sort of create that kind of immediate momentum? I mean, maybe yeah. it's, it's more complicated than just a Caitlin Clark type. Oh, yeah. But is there, you know, is there a lesson in the, it seems like, massive surge for the WNBA this year? Well, season? I had, I had a, a wonderful conversation with Roger Goodell recently, and he was telling me that the keys are being patient and continuing to hit big moments, moment after moment after moment. So we were both sitting there knowing that Caitlin Clark hasn't turned the WNBA around. The WNBA was crushing it before Caitlin Clark came in. They have been building and building and building. And it's not just Caitlin Clark with several million followers. There's two dozen other WNBA players with several million followers each. So it, it is, uh, we have as, as media, members of media, have this propensity to say like, strive to survive, you know? Yes. Ultimate fighter, yes. Caitlin Clark. And it is a, and I mentioned Roger because it is a full swing part of, yeah, it is a part of the process, moment, moment, moment. So you have to be on all the time, you have to keep hitting. Um, we have been growing at a, a tremendous clip year over year. We were pretty blunt when we came out, and it might have been on your podcast back uh, in 2018, and saying, hey, we want to grow as, as, to as big as the UFC and MLS are now in 2018 in half the amount of time. Mm. And the reason we felt like we do is we didn't launch during the mode of the big four era like they did, which is broadcast and cable, and it was hard to penetrate. We launched in 2018 with digital and social as evolved as it was, direct to consumer opportunities. Uh, we have a really hard working team. We're an agile business, we're wholly owned, so we're able to grow our revenue much quicker than teams or leagues that are trade association based, where you have a split of national and local, and there's a lot of times like fighting over categories. So give you an example, my experience as a pro lacrosse player was one that I thought sponsors, because I was at one point an MVP and champion, sponsors from every category should come mm. in. Oh, I should get Amex, oh, I should get Lexus, oh yeah. And like you realize, oh no, no. When you move outside of what they call endemics, you're in competition now with Tom Brady, mm. Peyton Manning, Serena Williams, Mia Hamm, Abby Wambach, and it's good luck. So I didn't get those deals. But when I did get a deal like Red Bull, they came in and go, okay, Paul's part one. Now we gotta spend with a league. Now we gotta spend with his team. Right? Now we have to spend with an editorial, a production house to bring this to life and spend what we brought to life on ESPN when his games are on. There's a lot of spends, it's hard. So I was sort of scratching my head when we were putting together our business model and go, okay, I know a lot of people like to use the sexy term turnkey, but like let's yep. actually build something that's turnkey. All right, so because we own the league, all eight teams, we negotiate marketing rights with players, we have an ability to buy based on an agreed upon rate card with ESPN and ABC ads that we can sell through and deliver directly to our partners. So when they come in, they can get everything at one price. We have a production house internally that creates spots. So if you flip on a PLL game, you see a Ticketmaster ad, our players are in it. You flip on a PLL game, you see a Cash App ad or a Rebel Bourbon ad or a Dude Wipes ad, our players are in it. A Whirlpool ad, same thing. So we've been able to unlock, which is why our, our partnership interest and partnership revenues have grown, I would suspect, suspect outsized to a, a league at our stage. Mm -hmm. um, so we are very forward thinking and constantly pushing ways that 
we can grow attention, revenue, maintaining the cost structure, not making mistakes that predecessors of other leagues have done in the past, um, so that people like you can watch us every week and enjoy it. Nice. You played at Hopkins, right? I did. So, real quick, NIL. I mean, is that, how yeah. does that affect you guys? Uh, what, what do you make of, of all that? Imagine if that had been in place. Well, I mean, which way? I, I, I have a lot to say on that, and I don't know how much time you <laughs> I'll have. Just open an entire new <laughs> yeah, what do you think of it? I, um, let me say, a year ago, I thought that it was going to be really good for tier two sports like lacrosse. Um, and the reason I say that is it sort of by psychological nature encouraged lacrosse players in college and high school to learn social media and to build brands. Mm. You know, the NBA was not always what it is today. You know, the David Stern era of the 80s and 90s with Adam Silver, who I think is fin phenomenal, um, they really went player focused and they started investing in player brands. And when you're Steph Curry coming in from Davidson, you know, he was transitioning, trying to figure out social, the NBA, boom, elevates. And then Steph takes it from there. Um, it's really nice, though, to have a Zion Williamson come in, you know, or a Caitlin Clark come in, already prepared. Right. And if NIL, for me, was a forcing mechanism for college athletes to come in prepared with baked audiences, that's valuable for us. Totally. Um, you know, I think they, they did a smart job, too, by ending terms on graduation from a corporate partnership standpoint. That's a clean transition. The collectives and all that other stuff, transfer portal opening up, I, I don't know yet how I feel about it. Uh, for a sport like lacrosse, it was a partial scholarship sport. Now what this has done is unlock the ability to get all full, full scholarships, which is the first time for lacrosse. Yeah. Football and basketball offer all fulls, so you have like 84 scholarships and 12 scholarships. The lacrosse was 12 and a half for a 44-man roster. Now, does that turn into the Premier League or La Liga, where like the universities like Ohio State and Syracuse just fund 44 full scholarships and beat the hell out of the other programs? Possibly, but that could also open another can of worms around the NWSL CBA that right. pushed off a draft no trade clause, we get caught on no trade clause, well, that's because they pushed off the draft. I think they're emulating European football where it's gonna be transfer fee based. So why would they have trades? It's transferring. They don't have trades in, in the Premier League. They don't have trades in La Liga or Bundesliga. Mm. It's transfers. Uh, how important is it to have big backers, and I don't necessarily mean financially, but kind of big fans and I'll ask about one in particular who is dear to both of our hearts, and that is Bill Belichick, has yeah. always been a big supporter, right? Yeah. Uh, we have certainly written recently about Belichick at FOS because he is entering his TV era. Yeah. But he's been a, a big kind of flag waver for you guys. Yeah, well, I think it's critical to have both. Long-term capital that some would say are irrationally passionate about a respective discipline. Um, and there's a history of that. Phil Antritz in the MLS, there's the Fertitta brothers in the UFC. We have someone like Joe Tai, who is, I would call, and I was with him this past weekend, the godfather of lacrosse. He played lacrosse growing up in the US. He played at Yale. He watches the Yale Bulldogs and some PLL games uh, from Air Joe when he's yep. handling his Alibaba work and all the other stuff he's going on with the Brooklyn Nets. and Nets, Liberty, Seals. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's an unbelievable person really strategic, very long on lacrosse, and we wouldn't be here without him. We have a group like Rain Ventures and Colin Neville, who also played lacrosse in college, who believed in our pursuit and wrote our first term sheet. I mentioned Arctos, we have the churning group. So when you have Peter Churn and Mike Kearns and Jesse Jacobs, who are historically supremely talented when it comes to media and tech businesses and personality-driven businesses, which I'll segue to, um, you've got yourself a really nice board. Um, that's critical. On the Bill Belichick front or personalities, sport intersects with culture. Mm. I think of Constance Schwartz, who's done such a good job with Smack and like developing, you know, whether it's entertainers like Snoop Dogg coming into sports or athletes like Michael Strahan going into entertainment. Uh, there's not a lot of people that understand how to shoehorn that because it is different audiences almost entirely. And I think basketball has gotten it right. Uh, European football gets it right. 
Uh, I still think American football is behind those two. Um, but talk about Taylor Swift and the impact that she's had on the anomaly that we call the NFL. She can even drive more hype to that massive engine. Um, so when you have a Bill Belichick, when you have a Method Man, when you have a Kevin Durant that are all in several ways a part of the PL, either as owners or uh, just fans of the sport, um, you know, guys like Steve Carell and John Bernthal and Justin Timberlake and Jamie Foxx and Justin Bieber, they all play the cross. And so part of my job is thinking about how do we get right. them back into the game that they once played? And I understand why they're not, because the pro game was fairly non-existent for the last 35, 40 years. Um, if you turn those engine lights on, people start noticing more. And when you have a sport like lacrosse, which similar to hockey, maybe in the 90s and early 2000s, has like certain stereotypes. There's like fighting for interest amongst fan bases to have someone who is a sort of iconic across sports and multiple disciplines vouch for you is pretty big. And that's why we launched our street lacrosse with, with Kevin Durant. So it tackled two things, a, a new and accessible way to play lacrosse, which is him and I grew up in the DMV and always played hoops because you always had a, a neighborhood court uh, and you could just play pickup. But a sport like lacrosse and football, you can't because they require 10 players per side, a goal, a goalie, and a bunch of pads. So let's just get sticks and tennis balls and play pickup lacrosse on a court. Um, and you know now we're gonna have a huge turnout from a celebrity and athlete standpoint at our street lacrosse event ahead of championship weekend in Philadelphia this September. Yeah, there's some Ice Cube, Big Three style wisdom in that, I think. Yeah. Um, let's end on this. Six years or so since the league started. Look into your crystal ball, next five to ten years, uh, you know, championship weekend has become a, yeah. a bigger story. Where will you guys be and, and how do you feel about where you are right now? Yeah, well, we eventized our championship weekend. So taking, call it NBA All-Star Week, uh, the NFL Super Bowl, um, and what event ties is we have our end of year awards on Friday, September 13th. We have street lacrosse in Philadelphia and our founders dinner, which is effectively our commissioner's dinner on Saturday the 14th. And then our game live on ABC at three o'clock on the 15th in Philadelphia at Subaru Park. So to be able to create sort of wraparound entertainment where you can bring in your partners, investors and other celebrities or influential folks that can uh, get a taste of the product for the first time is new for us this year. And we're really excited about it. Um, we talked about the innovative model being tour-based, um, and our first stage, when we first met, was that we didn't tie teams to cities, and we had six of them. Cut to this past season, which was our first year, where we are now eight teams from six. We put our teams in cities, and we kept our touring model by touring to those home cities. We saw an uptick in merchandise, in social media audience following, in ticket revenue, um, in local tune-in metrics as a result of like, now all of a sudden I'm a big sports fan in Utah and I have the Archers. When they're on, I'm watching. And when they're in town, I'm going and I'm wearing my Utah stuff and I'm buying more stuff. So that's phase two. Phase three is a decision that we'll make as we look forward into the Olympics and lacrosse getting back there in 2028. It's like, how do we continue to build this business model such that we either decide to go long and we're sort of a team sport taking an F1 model because it's going to work and it becomes profitable and all this other stuff. Or we decide to go, okay, now we're ready to sell teams. And if we sell teams, we're finding individual owners and markets that own venues that fit the right prototype from a cash and liquidity standpoint to a, you know prior existence or experience of running sports teams. And then we go from eight to measuring potentially 10 or 12 all on the right supply demand curves based on audience growth. Um, and we make a decision from there. But I sort of view the goalpost as Don Garber would often and notoriously be known for trading MLS against global soccer growth and things like getting the Olympics back to the US and the World Cup back to the yeah. US. We have this amazing moment, having worked hard to get lacrosse back in the Olympics in 2028, the first time since 1908 it was competing as a medal sport on the heels of an amazing Paris Olympic Games. Yep. It probably brought us back to the feeling that we had in the 90s watching the Olympics with yes. our family. It's going to be bigger in LA. So we're sprinting to aggregate a bunch of attention and momentum as we head through those goalposts. Yeah, huge chance for you guys. Nice.
Thanks, Paul. Thank you.